recording this and I am starting recording now. Um, so this will be available in case we have any technical difficulties or um, you experience technical difficulties. This video will be available on the Northwest Straits Foundation um, website at a later date. And um, anybody who is registered for this will get a link to that video along with any other information we feel is pertinent to share after the presentation. Um, and one last thing that uh, might be useful is there is a um, reactions button and as well as the chat, which I mentioned, if you hadn't found that yet, but um, reactions will pop up with um, thumbs up or you could give a clap or something if you just want to kind of interact with us as we're presenting. Um, it helps us know, you know, if you can hear us okay um, and that sort of thing. Um, so with that, I am going to clear all this stuff that I put on here and hand it over to Lisa Kaufman. All right, thanks, Tracy. Wow, this is a great turnout and appreciate everybody showing up tonight. Um, love looking at the diversity of locations it's coming from, from all over our, our North Sound region here. Um, so this virtual workshop tonight uh, is one of um, several in a series that we hope to offer over the next few months, and hopefully um, we can also maybe return to some in-person events later in the year, uh, if we're all lucky enough to get past these, uh, this crazy time we've been living through. Um, so as shoreline landowners, you're all deeply connected to the Salish Sea uh, and all the beauty and enjoyment that it provides. You know, several people have already mentioned in the chat how much they love um, the changes that they see, you know, every day, every season. Uh, and you as shoreline landowners see that more than anybody else. You're connected to it, you're there, uh, and you have a really good understanding of, you know, what goes on in your little neck of, you know, of the shoreline. Um, so, but we want to make sure tonight, um, you know, that we can bring you a little bit more of an understanding about, you know, what's really going on, uh, what those changes are that you're seeing. Uh, and increase your uh, understanding and knowledge of the place that you live and you recreate. So um, we hope to give you an in, uh, some insight into the shoreline characteristics, uh, the different types of shorelines and processes that develop and build those shores and sustain them, uh, give you an understanding of erosion management options, um, and also hope you come away um, with some knowledge of different shore-friendly actions that can reduce impacts of erosion uh, while also improving habitat. Um, so we've got many partners um, around uh, the region, around the Sound, that are working on, uh, on these kinds of issues along the shoreline. Uh, the Northwest Straits Foundation that I represent uh, is a nonprofit organization. Um, we work to restore and protect uh, marine resources throughout the Northern Sound, um, seven Northern counties of, um, of, of Washington. We're a science-based organization. Uh, we work with volunteers, uh, state, local, and federal agencies, tribes, and other nonprofits uh, to lead and support locally driven marine restoration, stewardship, and education programs. Locally here on for this particular shore-friendly program, uh, working with shoreline landowners, we're partnered with Island County, uh, Friends of the San Juans, um, and the Swinomish Tribe. Um, each of these organizations um, helps uh, landowners uh, to, to provide services, um, education, and outreach um, in order to help you um, make decisions on your property. And regionally, um, over the last couple of years, uh, the Shore Friendly programs have expanded into every single county uh, throughout the Puget Sound region. Um, so everything down from Thurston County all the way north up to Whatcom County is all represented by some form um, of, of a shore friendly program. So if by some chance, you know, you have uh, friends or family that live outside of the North Sound, uh, we can help you connect to your local um, or their local um, shore friendly program. Everybody's kind of re trying to achieve similar goals. Um, and the one thing I need to mention too is that the funding for these programs um, and assistance that we can provide comes from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife um, through the Estuary Salmon Restoration Program uh, and also through the, um, through the EPA, uh, through, the fe through federal funding for the EPA. So uh, in addition to learning about our shorelines uh, and what forms and supports them, tonight um, we're gonna provide you with an introduction to different ways that you can reduce erosion, protect your property um, and protect habitats. 
Uh, you can do that primarily, um, best, the best way to do that is by maintaining a natural shoreline. If you have an unarmored shoreline, um, that provides some of the best protection you can get. Additionally, um, some of the other things you can do um, is to make sure that you um, find alternatives to hard armor and remove armor when it's feasible. We'll talk about that, those kinds of options tonight as well. Making sure that you have a nice buffer of vegetation uh, along your shoreline is important as well. So trees provide a lot of protection. Uh, they hold in a lot of water uh, or they absorb a lot of water. And so that can help you as well. Tracy, go ahead. So by planting or maintaining a buffer of native vegetation and also removing invasives. Managing drainage is also a really important way to make sure that you prevent unnecessary erosion. And one of the final things that you might need to consider at some point, given the impacts of uh, existing sea level rise, increased storm surge, is that in some cases, one, one of the best things you might need to consider, and maybe even possibly the most economical, is actually moving your home um, or your infrastructure out of those danger zones. If you live on a bluff, uh, you might want to consider moving it as far back on the property as possible. And if you live on a low-lying shoreline, you might want to consider actually elevating those. And in some situations, it may actually be more cost effective uh, than trying to put in a bulkhead, which in many cases doesn't necessarily help reduce erosion impacts anyhow. So uh, tonight we're gonna also talk a little bit just about the Shore Friendly program, give you an introduction to that. Um, Shore Friendly, like I said a little bit, um, is really a, it's a program that's sound-wide providing uh, resources for shoreline landowners to help you make decisions. We do that through offering these types of workshops um, we also offer um, uh, beach walks along, you know, if you're within your community um, or in association with workshops. Good, Tracy. Keep kind of clicking through it. Shore Friendly, we have a new video series, which you just saw the, one of the first ones. Uh, we, you can sign up for free technical site visits, uh, either as an individual or, um, or as a community. We offer engineering design and permitting assistance. And we also offer cost share opportunities. So we can talk about some of those options um, or opportunities after the, um, after the program to give you some more ideas of uh, types of projects you can get engaged in. Um, everything from assistance for native vegetation, drainage management, uh, everything up all the way, including bulkhead removal potentially. Um, but we, will, uh, we can cover that more. And if you have more questions about those types of things, we can talk about that at the end. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Tracy and then um, hope you have enjoy the program tonight. Uh, one thing, if you have questions as we go along, we're going to have uh, stopping points throughout the, pro um, the presentation. So make sure if you have questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat room. And we'll be following those and answering a few of them at a time as, as we can. Uh, and any questions that we don't get to, we will provide answers to you in a follow-up email after the presentation. All right, thanks. All right, thanks a lot, Lisa. And thanks to the Northwest Straits Foundation for having us host this. I know myself and my co-presenter, Jessica, are really excited to... Um, share our knowledge about um, Puget Sound and um, get people interested in the sound and in shore friendly. Um, and actually, before we get going, just another kind of uh, thing to get to know you, I'm going to launch a poll um, that's just asking where you're from and um, why you're here. And so we'll give you a couple, you know, 30 seconds or so to answer. Um, Hopefully people can see that on their screen, participants. So yeah, there we go. We're having some answers come in. So give it a little bit of time, get as many as we can. So it, the questions are, how did you hear about this? We'd love to know that. Um, which county are you from? And does your property currently have shoreline armoring? Got about half of the respondents. We'll give it a little bit of time out of the 144 that are on the call tonight. All right, it's slowing down a little bit. So I'm gonna end polling and um, share the results. So it looks like most of you, um, over half of you heard about this through postcard mailings. Um, the majority of you are from Jefferson County with a smattering from all the other counties and, and one, one responded and is in somewhere other than the Northwest Straits Foundation service area. 
And then um, majority of you do not have shoreline armoring on your property. All right. Close that and then we'll introduce ourselves um, and then I'll probably shut my video back off. Um, so my name is Tracy Sanderson. Uh, I'm a professional wetland scientist and certified fisheries professional. I've been working in the consulting industry doing this for about 15 years. I'm the majority of it working um, with Jessica. Uh, I've worked all over the world, but the last five years, the majority of my um, work has been focused in Puget Sound. And I did go to school locally here and I grew up in, um, in Mukilteo. Um, went to school in Olympia. In this picture of me, I'm actually working on a project on the Columbia River fishing for sturgeon and I'm, I'm baiting um, hooks with pickled squid. That was one of my favorite projects I worked on and I did that for about seven years. Um, I'll pass it off to Jessica to introduce herself. Thanks Tracy. Um, Jessica Cote, so I'm a coastal engineer. I have a master's degree in coastal and ocean engineering. I'm also a licensed professional engineer. Um, I've been practicing as a consultant in Puget Sound for about 15 years now and been a coastal engineer for almost 20 years. Um, I am actually the founder of Blue Coast Engineering and um, after working at med many larger firms, I really wanted to focus my time and energy in Puget Sound. This image is, is I'm actually in the Arctic, um, standing on, a, on an icebreaker. So I, I got to travel the world doing various coastal projects, but we moved, my family and I moved to Seattle because we absolutely love being sandwiched between the mountains and the water and walking the beaches of Puget Sound. Um, so we feel very lucky and fortunate that to be able to do the work that we can do and really working on the health and restoration of beaches in Puget Sound. Awesome. Thanks, Jessica. Well, I'm going to start us off here. Um, first off, I'm just going to go over an overview of the presentation really briefly, the content that we'll go through. Um, so as I said, I'm going to start off, I'll talk about nearshore habitats on Puget Sound shorelines. And then I'm going to hand it off to Jessica, and she's going to talk about the forces that work on the shoreline, such as water levels, wind waves, wakes, tidal currents. Then she'll talk about how those forces change the shorelines over time talking about uh, cross shore beach profiles and literal drift. And if there's any um, phrases that come up that you don't know what they mean, hopefully by the end of this, you will have an idea what they mean or for sure, uh, drop a question in the chat box and we'll be sure to answer it. Then we'll go on to the human modifications of the shoreline. Most of this will be Jessica. She'll be talking about hard and soft shoreline protection. I will talk about vegetation on the shoreline and Jessica will talk about drainage and managed retreat, and then we'll wrap it up. And with any remaining time, we'll open it up to um, further question and answers. Um, and as Lisa said, any questions that we don't get to um, during this time, we will be reviewing the, the chat box dialogue and answering questions in a follow-up email. All right, so we've use the phrase near shore, I think so far in this presentation. And I wanted to define a little bit uh, what that means. From my perspective as an ecologist, I'm talking about any, anywhere in the upland portion from the shoreline, about one to 200 feet where there's a marine riparian buffer all the way down in the water to where sunlight can um, reach through the water column and plants and algae can grow. Um, in a jurisdictional sense, typically jurisdictions such as Island County or other counties say that anything within 200 feet of the ordinary high water mark on your shoreline um, is within the shore zone and would require then some sort of shoreline permit to do work within that area. Um, from a geological and coastal geomorphology perspective, the near shore is really more the intertidal zone that's shown here between the riparian intertidal and subtidal zone. Um, and it's the area where the waves and currents and wakes can do action on the sediment that's laying on the beach. Um, in a natural system, this area is highly interconnected and shoreline armoring, as we talked about, and if you were watching the short video that we had prior to six o'clock, um, 
Matthew Shipman was talking about um, how shoreline armoring can inter interrupt this connectivity between all these different zones and may physically um, remove a zone depending on where that armoring is placed in the near shore. I'm gonna use some um, circles to highlight just some of these interconnected, um, and you could maybe think of some of them as food web connections um, in the intertidal area, just to highlight how connected this area is. Um, erosion provides sediment to the beach, and Jessica will be talking a lot more about that as we go through. In that um, erosional deposition that happens on the beach, there can be um, trees that fall down. And this provides habitat in the back shore, as well as it may um, provide um, toe protection at at the toe of your bluff, if you live on a bluff. And studies have shown that armored beaches accumulate less wood than natural shorelines in Puget Sound. Terrestrial insects live on vegetation and they can provide food for fish. The vegetative um, buffer along the shoreline is also important for water quality. And studies have shown that um, an improvement in groundwater quality through vegetative buffers as short, small of a width as 10 feet. Marine vegetation is a rearing habitat for many species of fish. It's also, um, and crabs, other species that live in the water. And it's also an important foraging habitat for marine birds. Detritus from this marine vegetation provides food for insects that live on the sediments on the beach. And studies have shown that armored beaches have less of these invertebrates living in the sand, as well as they accumulate less rack on them. Forage fish, which I'll go into a little bit more detail on in a minute, are uh, spawn, a few of the species of forage fish spawn in the upper inner tidal. Um, and these forage fish are a food source for adult salmon as well as many other species um, up the food chain. Juvenile salmon, as well as other juvenile fish, spawn in small stream mouse and estuaries that were once common in Puget Sound along the shoreline. Many studies have documented that in particular, an endangered species, um, Chinook salmon, juveniles, um, use small pocket estuaries to rear prior to going out to the Pacific Ocean. This gives them a chance to get big so that they have a higher chance for survival once they return. When salmon come back to spawn, they bring ocean-derived nutrients such as nitrogen that go up our river systems and allow for um, growth of the riparian areas farther upstream. And as I mentioned, Chinook use the stream and estuary areas for rearing. And we do want to make sure that Chinook survive to grow up and get big because they are the primary food source for our endangered resident um, orcas. All those circles and diagrams was just to highlight the fact that healthy shorelines support up the food chain within Puget Sound. Now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on a couple of the species and things I talked about. Um, eelgrass and kelp are very important habitats in the near shore. Um, eelgrass is a flowering plant that you can find in sandy and muddy areas around the low tide line. Kelp is a general term for a type of marine brown algae and the kelp that's in this image is uh, bull kelp and the Northwest Straits Foundation and Northwest Straits Commission and the MRCs that fall under the commission um, have been doing kelp monitoring in the seven counties in Northern Puget Sound for the past, I believe five years. Um, that's actually me in the middle doing some volunteer work doing the kelp surveying. Um, Kelp and eelgrass are extremely important for salmon, for other juvenile fish, for juvenile rockfish, for crabs, for marine birds. If you go out to any area where there's an extensive uh, kelp or eelgrass bed, um, you will see a wide diversity of species. Um, herring, which are a type of forage fish, which I've touched on, um, need this sort of three-dimensional structure in the intertidal habitat to spawn. It's also important to note that people use seaweed um, for food. It's also used commercially. 
as a thickening agent, as well as other in other products that we purchase. And there has been research on the, its use as an alternative fuel or energy source. Salmon. We, talked a, we always talk a lot about salmon in Puget Sound. Um, Salmonids refers to the family of fish Salmonidae. Um, in Puget Sound, we have eight species of salmon or trout that show some sort of version of anadromy. And anadromy is um, when a fish is born in freshwater, out migrates to saltwater, and then returns to freshwater to spawn. In some cases, as with all of our uh, Pacific Northwest salmon, when they return to spawn, um, they die upon spawning. There are other cases, um, such as Atlantic salmon, where they can do this multiple times um, and not die. And as well as our local steelhead, which is an anadromous version of a rainbow trout, that can, on occasion, return um, multiple times for spawning. We also have bull trout and cutthroat trout, which um, show some can show anadromy um, in their life history. Um, when nearshore habitats and other rearing habitats for salmon are degraded, the fish that rely on these um, may not return to, um, may not survive the Pacific Ocean and return to spawn. And studies have shown that fish Many of our Pacific salmon are doing well in the freshwater environments and then are struggling at some point in the marine cycle and not returning to spawn. And if you're interested in learning more about that, um, the Marine Survival Project from Long Live the Kings has been doing a lot of that research. Talked a lot about forage fish. Um, forage fish is simply a category of fish. Um, referring to the fact that they are used for forage um, to other species higher up the food chain. Surf smelt and sand lance are a particular concern within the near shore because both of them spawn in the upper intertidal. And this spawning habitat can be impacted um, by shoreline armoring, either by physically covering the habitat, by uh, modifying the substrate through wave reflection off the armor, hard armoring, such that the substrate is no longer suitable for the forage fish to spawn on? Or is this common with shoreline armoring, behind the armoring, um, any of that marine riparian vegetation is typically removed and maybe replaced with lawn. And so any eggs that are spawned in that upper inner tidal are then exposed to more heat and, um, des and desiccation. So they may not survive to actually hatch. Um, Northwest Straits Foundation and Commission, um, the MRCs that are part of that, many volunteer, volunteers through this um, do some of the forage fish monitoring, as well as um, WDFW has an online forage fish spawning database that you can, um, you can look up your property and see um, if it's known that forage fish spawn um, on your beach. As well, um, the Northwest Straits Commission also has Sound IQ, which is another online GIS database that has information on forage fish, as well as um, many other um, habitat-based um, things that you could look up about your property. Um, just to show where forage fish spawn at, um, surf smelt and sand lance spawn fairly high on the beach. You can see here that it's, it's demonstrating that it's kind of just below where the riparian vegetation would start and where drift logs are at. So particularly for surf smelt, this is um, where most commonly any shoreline hard, hard armoring would exist. Um, and as I mentioned, um, herring need that three-dimensional structure such as algae, eelgrass, or kelp to, um, to spawn on. And now I'm going to hand it off to Jessica to talk about the different types of coastal landforms. Thanks, Tracy. So um, keeping in mind all of those different critters and um, fish and small and large critters and the interconnection of the, the food web that rely on these different parts of the beaches, we're going to talk a little bit more about what these landforms look like, how are they shaped, um, and how they evolved over time. So we have a lot of names, <laughs> there's a lot of nomenclature, um, and when we're dealing with coastal um, systems, we'll, we'll try to simplify it a little bit. 
Um, and so we're going to talk about some of these different pieces. So the this is gives you um, their geomorphology terms, and geomorphology is a is a word we use a lot when we're talking about shore friendly because it's the interaction between the hydrodynamic um, processes, the coastal processes, and um, the actual geology and the shorelines. And so it's the things that lead to the creation of these landforms. Um, and I'll talk about some of these ones that are shown here, but just notice that while there are, I'm gonna talk about some and them as distinctive, they are all connected. So that's a really important thing to remember when we're talking about um, shore friendly practices is that we need a variety of habitats to support all these different types of species to support the food web. Um, and they all are interconnected ultimately. Next slide. So rocky shores is one of the first one. This is one of the, the um, less common shoreline types um, actually in Puget Sound. And it's mostly in the Northern Puget Sound. And it's really derived by the geology, um, whether or not you have bedrock, basically underlying geology. So in the San Juan Islands, um, there are a lot of rocky shores, the most rocky shores. Um, there's certainly some in Skagit County as well, but maybe like Snohomish County, has many fewer, if any, um, rocky shorelines. They're much more resilient. Um, we don't tend to actually see a lot of uh, shoreline armoring, for example, or changes to rocky shorelines because they just don't change as quickly. They can change, but not nearly at the rate that maybe sandy beaches and some of the other shore forms change. They do have little pocket beaches that form within those rock outcrops um, that tend to be protected um, and have less energy. Next slide. Beaches. So beaches incorporate both the sand spits. Um, so also the bluffs are behind our beaches. Um, this is what we're going to talk about the most really during this presentation, because this is the most common um, location for people to live in Puget Sound. Next slide. So small estuaries and lagoons are formed between two sand spits. So we have the beaches and we have sand that's uh, accumulating in sand spits. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and how they form. Um, but the small estuaries and lagoons form behind these. Um, there certainly uh, can be residences as there is in, in this figure that live on these landforms. These are incredibly important for juvenile salmon. Um, it's been found that the density of juvenile salmon inside of these types of systems is much higher than out on the beach because they can come in with the tide and they can rest and they can feed. Um, a lot of these types of systems have been filled in Puget Sound over time. So they might actually be freshwater marsh now instead of saltwater marsh. And that's another type of shore form that we're working on restoration of. Um, those are usually fairly big types of projects um, that, that we think about. Um, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about these types of systems. They tend to be pretty protected. And again, it tends to be one of those locations you don't see a lot of shoreline armoring because they're protected from the forces. It's just the rising and falling of the water levels inside these systems. Next slide. River deltas um, are the last sort of specific shore form I'm gonna talk about. Um, the Skagit River and the Stillaguamish River certainly contribute sediment to a lot of the beaches and shorelines that some of you may live on, particularly like Camano Island. You'll be pretty close to the Stillaguamish River or the Skagit River. We're not gonna talk about the, uh, the mechanisms that form the shorelines within the river deltas. Those are river dominated systems and we're really talking about marine shorelines here primarily. While there certainly can be tidal, there is tidal influence in these estuaries. Um, a lot of this tends to be more like farmland, but they're, they're another just really important in terms of salmonids and other um, marine life in terms of the nutrients. And Tracy touched on, on that um, and really spent some time talking about the anadromous fish um, that come out of the stilly and the skagit. So they migrate. If you live close to these systems, it's important to maintain a healthy shoreline because those fish coming in and out of those river deltas really depend on the resources along the shorelines um, in order to make their way out and grow and then to make their way back. All right, thanks, Jessica. We're actually, we're gonna um, launch our, our second poll here. Um, based on what Jessica um, was just talking about, we wanna know what sort of shoreline you live on. 
We do have a couple of options for those of you that are just listening in and don't live on the shoreline, or, you know, if you're still not sure based on what we've said, that's an option as well. Interesting. I see there are lots of bluffs and don't worry, I am going to talk more about bluffs. I promise. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going to end the polling and share the results so everybody can see this. Um, yeah. So bluff was um, definitely more than 50% and just a smattering of all the other ones. Um, I guess, uh, Lisa, if you have um, maybe let's, I think based on time, we'll just do one question now to kind of break it up and then we'll hopefully have lots more time at the end for additional questions. I haven't really had too many uh, at all. Actually. Okay. Um, oh, okay. The primary question has really been um, for us to define shoreline armoring. And I always forget to do that at the beginning. So, <laughs> we took care of that in the, in the, in the chat, but shoreline armoring is basically uh, structures that are built on the shoreline um, you know, bulkheads, groins, seawalls, those types of things um, that are intended to prevent erosion. Um, and, uh, but as you've already heard a little bit um, so far, they're usually built in those areas of that, criti that critical habitat that we're looking to protect as well. So we'll talk more about that later though. Okay, awesome. All right, well, I think we'll, we'll I'll hand it back to Jessica to kind of go through some of the natural processes that are going on on the shorelines. And I appreciate the comment in the chat that um, the Salish Sea, which is a more encompassing term than just Puget Sound, is an estuary itself. It's a very good thing to remind ourselves. It's actually, um, I think it's the second largest um, estuary in the United States. Um, and it's, it is a very large estuary. So when we talk about the barrier embayments and the lagoons, they often refer to them as pocket estuaries because they're smaller estuaries within our big estuary. So, um, so one of the things about estuaries, so estuaries are affected by tides. Um, so it's the rising and falling of the water levels. It's the gravitational force between the sun and the moon that drives these. They're predictable. Um, they are, I don't wanna say, sometimes we refer to them as being static, but that just means that they're predictable. So we can, um, we know what tides will be on any given day. Um, so I'm showing here an image of the different tidal datums. So these are uh, statistical levels, tide levels that we use when we're thinking about design and when we're thinking about beaches and where do natural habitats fall within these um, relative to these different water levels, but also where does infrastructure or other types of alterations to the shoreline fall. So the important thing to notice about um, this natural shoreline that's not had any impairment of any kind um, is that the distance between mean high or high water and what we call king tide or the highest astronomical tide, which happens a few times a year, as I'm sure many of you have, um, have observed, is it's a pretty wide area. And it goes from sand to coarser sediment. There's a lot going on here. There's wood accumulating. Um, it's also where vegetation um, starts to grow, saltwater vegetation. And um, oftentimes you might hear ordinary high water marks. So the ordinary high water mark usually falls, falls within this zone, usually somewhere closer to the king tide, highest astronomical tide usually than mean higher high water. Um, and then mid tide level and mean lower low water finally is really when the tide's way out. And you can um, see the most of your beach usually at that kind of elevation. Okay. So when structures are installed, shoreline structures, shoreline armoring, we have a lot of words for this. Um, when they're installed along the shorelines, they're typically placed somewhere between mean high or high water and the highest astronomical tide. Sometimes a little bit lower, if they're a little bit lower than that, then there's probably been a lot of changes to the beach because it's really interacting with the water levels. Um, but even um, on this upper beach, Tracy talked about the forage fish and where they like to spawn. They really like to be on this upper portion of the beach. They really like to be on this upper portion of the beach. Um, and this tends to be covered up by, uh, by shoreline armoring. The other thing to note is 
wood has a really hard time accumulating um, in front of shoreline armory. It would naturally accumulate in, in, on shorelines, um, but if the water levels are interacting with the structure, it tends to prevent that wood from accumulating. Um, we also have less vegetation that can really support various habitats um, when there's armor on the upper shoreline. So this is an example of um, water levels changing, coming up and down along a shoreline. There is a creek here, a stream rather, so that's the sort of long sinuous um, feature that you see. And then um, but a couple of things to note. So the at seven feet, this is um, around the mid tide, sorry, mean high or high water is around nine feet here, so right here. And then as we come up, this little animation goes up to about 11 feet, which is that highest astronomical tide. This is a really low lying area. And um, there is a beach berm here, there is wood here, but even with that beach berm and wood, because it's a low lying area, the water levels, they come up, and you'll start to see some water ponding even behind the higher areas on the beach, the beach berms. See, there's some blue showing up right now because beach berms are porous. And the water goes fairly high up on these properties. And this is a natural condition, um, but just gives you a sense of how high tides in themselves can, can actually um, penetrate along the shoreline. So it's fairly well recognized now that we are experiencing climate change. Um, we are experiencing sea level rise. So at the Seattle uh, tide gauge station, there's been measurements being collected since the, since the 1900s. Um, the data is more precise since the 1950s. And it's been determined that the overall sea level rise in Seattle specifically has increased about five inches between 1950 and around 2010. So over about 60 years, the overall, the average level of the water in Puget Sound at Seattle Gage has gone up by about five inches. And this is a National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration data. Next slide. Um, however, along with sea level rise, the land can be changing. So we think of land as being static, um, but it's actually not, especially around here where we have um, tectonic changes. So we have plates that are subsiding underneath of other plates. So some parts of Puget Sound are actually um, increasing elevation. The land is coming up or uplift. In some places it's actually getting lower, lower or it's subsiding. So the blue is indicating subsidence. Most of Puget Sound is subsiding, but a number of you may actually live in areas where there is actually some uplift. So San Juan County, Clallam County, has some areas that are, that are uplifting. There's some online tools. We'll be sending out some links to information where you can go to get more information. You can map your own properties um, at the end of this presentation. And there's a link um, to, the, uh, to a tool where you can do that um, specifically for this kind of information. So how does that uplift and subsidence really affect sea level rise? Um, well, in Whatcom County where um, it's not really experiencing um, any significant uplift, at least uh, you know, relative to the current measurements. Um, you're gonna see between a half a foot and two feet of sea level rise over and up until the year 2100, approximately. There's a range in all sea level rise predictions, and that's because there's a lot of assumptions that go into this. There's a lot of assumptions about how much greenhouse um, gas emissions we're putting into the air and how is that driving climate change and all of these other factors. So there's always a range. That's what these various lines are showing. But think of Whatcom County, let's say two feet by 2100 without really um, much um, uplift or subsidence, pretty static in terms of the actual land. And then the next slide. Now you might remember though in Clallam County, I mentioned that they're experiencing uplift. So in Clallam County, um, by 2100, the sea level rise may only be about a foot and a half. And that's because the land is rising along with the seas rising. And so therefore the seas are not rising as fast as relative to the land. So that's a lot of information, <laughs> um, but it's important to consider because we are, you know, it's difficult to predict out into the future. And so, 
we do want to think about all of these different changing factors, all of these different components that go into the water levels along your shoreline. And just to add on to that, we got tides, we got sea level rise, and now we also have storm surge. So that's the, the last thing that, that we'll talk about. Um, and, and that's related to wind waves, which we'll talk about in a minute, but storm surge, think of it as additive on top of all these other forces, and um, it can re start to result in um, like more extensive flooding when you, especially when you combine all of these things together. And the infrastructure in Puget Sound, so this shoreline armoring that we're talking about, most of it was built a really long time ago. So 50 years, sometimes longer. Um, some of it was, was done as aesthetics, you know, delineating the line between um, the upland grass and the beach in a park, for example. So this is Alki Beach. Um, and you can see that the water levels are exceeding the top of this structure by quite a lot. Um, it certainly didn't do that when the structure was built <laughs> because that would be a very bad engineering design. Um, so it's the combination of this sea level rise and um, this happened to be an extreme high tide event. Um, we're also getting some additional wind wave events. Um, so all of these changes together is basically creating problems for the infrastructure that we put in place over time. Um, go next slide. So this is actually a, a barrier spit with a barrier embayment behind it. And so in these places, so barrier spits are actually meant to be overwashed. They're, the, they're a type of shore form that can be really dynamic and change with storm events. Um, but when we put roads and infrastructure and we fix this in place, well, obviously it's not gonna move. Um, and so it doesn't have the ability to change. Um, so this is just showing a, a, a pretty extreme event. Um, obviously they know that this happens. There's a sign here saying, you know, watch for water and debris in the road at high tide. Um, but one of the things that we're noticing is that these events start to become more frequent over time. Um, but as the water levels have gotten higher with sea level rise and with the storms. The other thing is that we talk about is coastal squeeze, which means that, so since the, the seas are rising in terms of elevation, we're getting these storm events. Um, we're getting, we've also lost some sediment on our beaches, which I'll talk a little bit more about. That area that can change and can be dynamic on the beach has gotten narrower and narrower. And so um, it's really, it's squeezing out the habitat and it's also squeezing out the, the places where um, homes can even be placed as well. All right, um, we're actually gonna take a little brain break for uh, Jessica for a minute and have you guys exercise your brains and ask you a question, a um, couple of questions related to sea level rise. Um, do you think the structures on your property are currently at risk from sea level rise? And do you expect to make changes to your property because of sea level rise or climate change? And when we're talking about structures, we're not talking about um, the armoring structures that you may or may not have. We're talking about like your house or your, um, you know, your boathouse, you know, those sorts of structures on your property. give people a few minutes to, to answer. And I suppose if you are even one of those people who uh, don't live on the shoreline, you could still answer number two because uh, climate change may affect properties even if you are, are not directly on the shoreline. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end polling and share the results with people. So a majority of people say they don't think they're currently at risk from the structures on their property are currently at risk from sea level rise and um, not expecting to make changes to your property because of sea level rise or climate change. Okay, um, Lisa, if you have any questions, um, we probably have time for um, one right now. All right, we've had one from Sue Madsen, who I think is from Skagit Fisheries Enhancement Group. Um, which is a really interesting question. What would the effect of sea level rise on accretion versus erosive beaches be? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so you're gonna see the changes related to sea level rise um, 
in to a larger extent on a on erosive beaches and we are definitely going to talk about sediment transport we're going to talk about erosion and accretion um we we use those terms um most people know what erosion means accretion means you're actually you're gaining sand so believe it or not there are some places that actually accumulate sand over time i think um, a lot of folks tend to live more in the uh, the erosive um, areas, but um, or transport is would be the, the area in between those two. So sea level rise definitely has a larger effect um, in places where there's trans that are transport zones where it just sort of moves along the way, um, and also in areas that are eroding as opposed to um, locations that are accreting. Unless the exception to that is really on the bluffs. So the steep high bluffs, we're gonna talk about how they discharge sediment and they feed the beaches and they, they adjust. So if the bluff has the ability to have a slide and there's not a home at the top that's sliding with it, um, then they are um, actually more resilient to um, the changes related to sea level rise because they have their own sediment source that they're discharging to the beach and they're really helping to create beaches. So we'll touch more on that too. Okay, and I'll, I'll just add a little bit from the um, ecological side of things that, I mean, it's generally understood that um, climate change has happened before in Earth's history, but for critters, it's the rate of change which is difficult for them to adjust to. And so that's, that's really the issue when it comes to the ecological, biological side of things. And a good example of this in the near shore zone is those forage fish that we have talked about. It will, takes them generations and generations to be able to modify their spawning behavior. And if they're getting squeezed out of that band of area where they're able to spawn at in the upper intertidal, um, at too fast of a rate, they may not be able to adjust their behavior um, in time with uh, sea level rise and climate change. We'll go on and Jessica will talk about some of the physical processes going on on the shoreline. Okay, so um, wind waves. We spent a lot of time talking about wind waves um, related to shorelines because it's one of the dominant mechanisms that really shapes the shorelines and moves sediment within Puget Sound specifically. Um, and to the extent that uh, wind waves affect a particular shoreline, it's not only um, dependent on the wind speed, it's also dependent on how long that wind is blowing for how long of a distance. So if you look out your property across the shoreline, how far of a um, distance of unimpeded water can you observe? So if you have a long, that's called the fetch. If you can have a long fetch, you're gonna tend to have larger wind waves. Um, it's also uh, dictated by depth, by water depth. I think a lot of um, folks, sometimes in Puget Sound, it feels like wind waves are, are really large, but if you've been out to the Washington coast, you'll certainly observe that they get much, much bigger than that, surfing kind of waves. And that's because there's a very large ocean and, and infinitely, not infinitely deep water, but very deep water. And so they can build up more energy and grow much larger. It's limited in Puget Sound. Wind waves can only get so big in Puget Sound before they feel the bottom and they lose some of their energy as they feel the bottom um, propagating across the water. So this is a graphic by Cliff Mass, one of my, my favorite weather folks. And um, it just helps you to understand how the wind in Puget Sound is driven. So we talk a lot about how wind from the south blowing towards the north actually create the strongest events. So we just had a Pineapple Express. You might have heard that term before um, on Sunday. And a lot of that is because of the mountain ranges and the sheltering of the mountain ranges. Um, and so winds are funneled across the southern end of the Olympic Mountains and up through Puget Sound. And then there's this convergence zone. Now, for those of you who are living up in the northern counties, you also are very susceptible to winds out of the West. So although those winds may not have as strong of forces, they might be more common, um, depending on the exposure of your particular property. So this is something we, we look at very closely when we're looking at a shoreline. If we come out to do a site visit, we definitely will pay attention and look at, um, sorry, 
um, that I was distracted by the chat, but he's on the chat. Um, we will definitely look at wind waves and the wind wave exposure. Because not in all locations, we're talking about armor removal, but I also want to be cognizant that there's not all um, properties have the ability to remove armor. If you're in a, a higher wind wave climate, then it may be difficult. Just a little video. Thinking about wind waves. Um, so, caused by wind goes across the not only the sound but the lakes as well. Talk about tides. So the tides and the wind waves they all move sediment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Vessel wakes also move sediment. It depends on where you live. Um, this is Rich Passage, which I just saw somebody actually mentioned in the, the chat. Um, and so vessel wakes can affect the shoreline, can affect um, sediment movement, if it's in a, what we consider to be a confined waterway. So if boats are, are traveling in a distance that's fairly close to shore. It also depends on the kind of boat, the size of the boat. Vessel wakes don't affect all shorelines in Puget Sound. It really just depends on where you live. Um, a lot of people think that tidal currents are a strong um, uh, mechanism for moving sediment. Really in Puget Sound, that's mostly applicable to places that are narrow. So in narrow waterways where um, the rising and falling of the tides can accelerate. And then as it, the tides move out into wider areas, um, those forces tend to decrease. So they're not typically one of the primary um, transporters of sediment or causes of erosion in Puget Sound. So shorelines change a lot over time. And there was um, quite a lot of studies done at Cama Beach on Camano Island um, by a UW grad student to understand how waves interacted with the shorelines. And so on the left, you're seeing a graphic that is a natural beach that has a storm berm and has sediment available so that when waves interact with the middle of the beach, and the reason that they interact most frequently in the middle of the beach is because that's the area that's flooded by tides um, most of the time and gets, has the water level is basically able to act on that portion. Um, it's able to remove some sediment from the berm and then it creates a bar a little bit further down on the beach. Uh, if you have a seawall or a structure um, on the, the property um, or on the shoreline, then the waves are interacting with that seawall structure. It doesn't have the same volume of sediment available to be able to move and be dynamic. And so you get erosion at the toe of the structure and you get some sediment deposited further down, um, but it's less sediment. The other thing is that um, the one on the left, the natural shoreline, this, the sediment in the bar will actually come back as the wave forces. This is sort of a winter condition. And then as we go into a summer condition, that sediment will make its way back up the beach and accumulate again, if it has a place to accumulate. So having the armor, depending on where that armor is located, can really disrupt that process. Next slide. So it's really important to recognize that erosion is a natural process. I think that um, it's often thought of as being um, a really negative um, thing, but uh, erosion is a natural process that happens. And it's a very, it's the most important mechanism for maintaining the sediment and the health of our beaches. Um, we need that sediment to be discharged in order to allow those dynamics to occur. So sediment moves, so from the bluffs, it discharges down onto the beach itself. Um, wind waves tend to move sediment along shore. So the wind waves, um, especially if wind waves are blowing from the south, for example, and your property, you're, you, when you look out, you're facing east or west, then it'll move it along shore from the south to the north. So they tend to, wind waves move sediment in the direction in which the wind is blowing towards. Um, and the wind waves are propagating towards uh, the, as the sediments deposit on the beach, if you play that one more time, Tracy. 
So there are the wind waves blowing in across, um, towards the shoreline, bouncing along the shoreline, moving sediment along shore. And then, and it tends to accumulate in places where there's changes in the curvature of the shoreline. And that's where the sand spits tend to form. So where all of a sudden it's, it's not as exposed to as significant of wind waves, there's a change in the shoreline orientation and you get these sand spits forming. And then that also just showed the little graphic of the slide and how that feeds the beach. You can go to the next one. So to think about this a little bit more in terms of the direction, if you stand out um, uh, on your beach at low tide and look back up at your property, um, you, you look for features where there's something on the beach. It could be a, a log as we're showing here, or it could be a rock. And you might notice that the elevation of the beach is a little bit higher on one side compared to the other. So the um, side that it's higher on, is where, so the winds are blowing from that direction away from that. So it'd be, it accumulates on one side and then it might be a little bit lower on the other. So this happens naturally where um, there, there is the wood that's located. Um, but if you go to the next slide, Tracy. So sometimes um, people put in groins. This is really common on the East Coast. And so these are structures where they're built from the shoreline out into the water and they're actually intended to block sediment. So you're confining the sediment. You're basically creating your own little pocket beach. Remember those rocky headlands we talked about and the little pocket beaches between the two of them? This is creating a little pocket beach. We strongly discourage this because you're then starving your neighbor <laughs> from sediment and it doesn't allow the natural process of sediment to, to move along shore. But it just emphasizes that alongshore changes are very common, um, and that's what happens in a transport zone. So this is an example of where um, th this can be a, a beneficial process. So there was a continuous structure here, and um, they created a little pocket beach. So they basically removed that hard armor, and then they put in sediment. And so they've created two little groins. So you can see where the little groins are. Um, there's a, a sculpture, Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle is another example of this. And so it's that groin is preventing the sediment from moving outside of that um, beach and creating a little beach. So um, Tracy, actually go back again. So thinking about this, so as I mentioned, so the sand really can't move right from within these two little cells. So it's in what we're calling impeding drift. This is, we can think of this as a little mini littoral drift cell. Littoral drift cell, go ahead and the next one, is just a fancy word for um, the length of shoreline that sediment can move before it gets disrupted by a change in curvature of the shoreline. Maybe it's a cove. Sediment tends to accumulate in um, a lot of coves and embayments. Maybe it's a rocky headland. Um, this is an online database from Department of Ecology, Coastal Atlas. You can go in and look and see where do you sit in um, the littoral drift cells. So places that are red are called, are no appreciable drift, which basically just means that they're, it's not really changing over time. Those tend to be the actual headlands. Those tend to be the changing in direction. And so Sometimes, some places it's moving right to left, others it's moving left to right. It's really driven by your wind wave exposure. So beaches also change, so they change seasonally and annually. I mentioned that they're just really dynamic. Um, and even if you have a structure, you're still gonna see the, those changes over time. And then you may see longer term changes as well. Um, at this particular location on the, the top in the winter, um, sand has become exposed. So that doesn't necessarily mean that this beach is, is a long-term erosional beach. It just means that wind waves have come in and they've changed the substrate and the gravel is gone for right now. But in the summer, on the um, graphic in the lower one, you can see that that gravel comes back. So we've been doing some long-term measurements in a number of locations and observed that a lot of beaches change about on a four-year cycle. And so you might actually see um, a long-term change and it might look really low one year. And if you wait two or three years, it actually, the sediment might come back and come back up. 
And that's all a function of this whole littoral drift cell that we talked about. Talked about. So it's this, if, if there's a sediment source, so if there's material that's being eroded from the bluffs and being deposited on the beach, then it can transport along shore and it can change these beaches over time. Um, this is just another sort of example in showing the differences between a winter and summer profile. Um, just to really <laughs> drive home that point that beaches want to change. And so um, one of the goals of the shore friendly program and, and the removing of hard armor and potentially if we remove hard armor, then we're gonna talk about coming in, maybe bringing in some sediment that's been lost over time, bringing in some wood to restore that beach profile, but giving that beach room to be able to change with the changing water levels, the changing sea level rise, um, and so that it maintains its habitat so that we can create good habitat it can allow that habitat to change and modify itself naturally, create a summer profile, go back to a winter profile um, with the storm events. So I think a few people have um, asked some questions in the chat about the sort of low bank, no bank, medium bank, high bluff, high bank. Um, what do we mean by that? So generally um, beaches are low bank or no bank. Um, and these transitions between low bank, medium bank, high bank can happen very quickly along our shorelines. Um, in the forefront of this image, this is a, a basically a no bank property. So less than five feet, we think of low bank, no bank as being places that you don't really need a staircase to access. Like you could scramble down, you know, the beach or the little bit of bluff. I mean, five feet may seem kind of high to not have stairs, but you don't have a large staircase to be able to access. Um, low bank, no bank are really dependent on sediment supply from the adjacent bluffs. So they are depending on having a sediment source where sediment's being transported um, to their beach to maintain their beach. Wood accumulates and stabilizes beaches on low bank and no bank, the most amount of wood. Um, and also there's a, a whole back beach area that has usually low growing vegetation on low banks and no banks. Lots of dune grasses and pretty wide back beach areas. Medium bank is between um, about five feet and 20 feet. So we think of these as properties where you can build a staircase to get down to the shoreline. It's not so high that a staircase looks, you know, just sort of insurmountable and, you know, you're gonna lose your breath going up it, <laughs> sort of speak. Um, the natural processes on the, the medium bank homes, um, still that weathering of that bluff face is a really important process that can feed material to the beach. A lot of these medium banks we see that have the ivy and have a lot of invasive species because they've been disturbed. A lot of vegetation's been removed from the top of them. Um, and so they're, they're one of the more challenging properties to um, maintain and also um, to really uh, revegetate as well because of the, the height, but it definitely can be done. Um, you do still get some wood accumulating at the toe of here, not as much, right? It doesn't have that really wide flat beach with that really smooth gradual transition from salt vegetation to um, the upland vegetation. It's more steeper and it has more um, rapid transition. If you do have vegetation, so naturally vegetation would grow all along the top of these banks and tend to stabilize the bank and as well as the bank face. High banks or bluffs, so bank height, we think of them as bank height greater than 20 feet. You know, that's just kind of a range. Um, they tend to be prone to landslides. Medium bank properties can also be be prone to landslides. Um, so they're, they're not, uh, yeah, they can also be prone to landslides, which really depends on the geology and the drainage um, and some other factors, which we'll get into. But um, landslides, I've talked a lot about them. They supply sediment and wood to the beaches. Um, vegetation at the top of high banks and bluffs are the things that allow the water that's falling to um, distribute itself and to get down into the ground so that hopefully um, it doesn't actually create a additional erosion that's really unnecessary. Um, if 
if there's storm water running over the face of a high banker block. And we'll talk a little bit more about damage management. Um, oh, I thought we were going to take a break. Okay, one more slide. So groundwater, <laughs> groundwater movement. Um, so I mentioned drainage. So drainage, um, so about 40% of our shorelines, 40% of the shoreline was covered with vegetation um, prior to us basically developing our shoreline. So if you think about that relative to your own home and, and lot, like 40% is a lot. Um, so that's a lot of trees that were there to spread out the water, to uptake the, the roots, to uptake the water. And now, in addition to removing a lot of the vegetation, not just from shorelines, but even from upland, we also have these all of these other sources of more concentrated water that we're putting into the ground. Um, and so we, we tend to oversaturate the ground. And if it hits what we call an impervious layer, so clay, silt, not so much sand, um, then that's where we see these slip faces develop. And that's where we see a lot of uh, landslides occur. And that's really the primary risk to the, these high bluff homes, particularly that one you saw that's sitting right on the edge. Okay, we are going to take a break here. So I think, um, what do we think for a break based on our timing? Um, Maybe we'll come back at like 12 after, give everybody about four minutes for a bio break, grab some more water, and then we should have time for a question um, or two before we continue on with the rest of the presentation.
Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and, and get back started. Um, and Lisa, I guess um, if there's any uh, questions that you've seen that we could address now, we probably have time for one or two. Yeah, um, first of all, um, there's been a lot of questions just about specific um, locations, people's specific property issues. And um, I've, been put, I've been putting up a couple times in the chat, um, just a link to the um, site visit um, request form. Um, so, you know, you're welcome to sign up for a free site visit. Um, but we definitely had a, had a couple questions um, going back to the littoral drift. Um, you know, how do you define the direction? Um, and uh, maybe just kind of talk about that a little bit more. You answered it, Lisa. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so, go ahead. Or you want me to do it? No, yeah, I've been talking. You talk. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> So when the surveys were done along uh, the entire shoreline of Puget Sound to determine um, the different drift cells, and it's been done a couple times to update it, um, it's done by boat. So all of the directions you see on those maps um, are from a boat looking towards land. So if it's to the left, then it's looking, you know, kind of up the shoreline. Um, if it's to the right, it's looking down the shoreline um, because you have to do all that from the boat. Yeah. Yeah, and I would I would actually emphasize that. We, we've had some conversations about this as, as practitioners on the shoreline. We typically, if I'm talking about a direction to or a direction from, I'm actually standing out on the beach looking at your shoreline. So that's probably a pretty safe assumption. It's pretty unusual that I'm standing at the shoreline, you know, looking out because of, we're, we want to think about the forces that are acting on the shoreline or the changes that are affecting along the shoreline. So we're usually standing out at the water's edge looking up. Yeah, if I can just quickly add on to that one a little quick, you know, when we talk about like fetch, it's also kind of the distance of, you know, the amount of water between the you know, bodies of land from, you know, one to the next as well. You might hear that term used too, but um, along shore, definitely looking from the beach towards the, towards the shoreline. Any other burning questions you have right now, Lisa? No. I've been asked, I've been trying to answer a bunch of them as we go along, but again, we'll, um, we'll kind of summarize all these questions and answer any, any that we can't get to um, when we provide you guys with follow-up information too. Okay, great. Good questions out there. So there's been a lot of questions about what is shoreline armoring? Well, here are some examples and it comes in many flavors and styles um, in Puget Sound. So it could be a vertical concrete wall um, it can be uh, creosote timber. Um, it can be large rock that's stacked on top of each other. Um, and as I, I, I mentioned a couple of times, this was, this it was a cultural norm, honestly, in Puget Sound. It was like, okay, we're building a house. Let's, you know, put in our bulkhead and then we've got our upland lawn and our sort of our front yard thinking, I think of a front yard and backyard and we're going to delineate these different zones. Um, it's really not, you know, been until fairly in the last 20 years or so that we've really recognized um, all the impacts and all the changes that, that um, have resulted from armoring the shorelines. So I mentioned this a few times, but we, we think of armor as um, um, impounding sediment or stopping sediment from being able to be deposited on the beaches. And that's really true of any armor, whether it's a low bank, high bank, you know, again, it just doesn't allow the interaction with sediments and with beach and with the wave forces. What it does also do is it actually, the, the waves, instead of being absorbed by some of that sand and the wood and all those other natural elements, um, it actually reflects that wave back and so it can actually increase erosion um, along the tow. And we see this pretty frequently. We see different big changes in sediment type, um, much coarser sediment, a lot less sand usually in front of the, the armoring because of that wave reflection. Um, and so, you know, this is just another example of where building right within that zone um, can really increase the scour. And so on the, the right is, um, a previous photo when the toe of this bulkhead was actually covered with sediment and then over time it's actually scoured out and so there's totally there's sand 
you, and usually when you see gravel, that's actually what we consider kind of an armor layer and it actually is protecting the beach and there's often sand underneath it. Um, so in this case, it's really scoured out all that it was those other gravels and um, exposed the toe of that structure, which isn't good for the structure or the upland or anything else. Um, we mentioned a few times about how, you know, shoreline structures, they prevent sediment supply, but so they also prevent that habitat from establishing now. So those forage fish that want to spawn, they will still spawn on these hard structures and these rocks, but unfortunately they don't live because it's like frying an egg in a pan. They get really warm. Um, they, they like, you know, in the sun basically just heats up those structures and then they fry. There's also just not the wood, there's not the insects falling from the vegetation, um, there's not the complexity of habitat for a lot of other critters to be able to establish uh, when we have structures along the shoreline. Um, and then the armoring of feeder bluffs is similar in that regard. So it can appear as though it's, it's stopping erosion, um, but it's not preventing landslides. Landslides will happen whether a structure is there or not, because they're initiated much higher up in the bluff base. They are rarely initiated because of undercutting of, of wind waves at the toe. It's typically something higher in the bluff base that's initiating, whether, whether it's a geologic slip face, whether there's additional you know, water being concentrated there. There's a variety of mechanisms, but um, shoreline structures, they do not limit the risk of landslides and they do impound sediment behind them to some period of time. I've actually seen some places where um, the slides come down and the trees come down and then they just fall over the top of the structure at some point and they don't become effective at, for any reason. So what can we do? <laughs> um, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, so there definitely are opportunities for, for hard armor removal. Um, if you were listening in the beginning to Hugh Shipman talking, the erosion rates on Puget Sound beaches, they're pretty slow compared to like the open coastline, for example. So um, we can come in, we can remove that hard armor, and we can actually recreate a natural beach. Um, sometimes that means that we might actually have to bring in sediment. So we bring it in from quarries um, in order to reestablish where the beach was. Sometimes we bring in wood. Sometimes there's wood already there. Um, we frequently will ask about planting. We want to have a healthy buffer of vegetation, not just um, saltwater type of vegetation, but also riparian trees, diverse native vegetation um, that really supports that habitat and all the other beach functions and helps to stabilize some of the soils on the uplands. I will mention that any of these actions, even removing hard armor, these require permits. So there is an extensive number of regulatory permits that are required um, basically to do anything on your shoreline. And that's just something that the you know, shore friendly programs are really geared towards helping property owners navigate because it's, it's not easy, it's not straightforward, it's, and <laughs> it, it can be complicated, but we really wanna encourage um, shoreline practices that, it, that improve habitat and, and assist property owners with this. So, so it starts with a site visit and then can build from there if it's the right kind of project and, and willing landowner. So this is just a closer look of some of those things that I mentioned, those the softened uh, shorelines. So the wood, and I would actually say this is probably a narrow stretch of wood compared to a lot of the beaches in Puget Sound or if you're looking at more of sand spits. Um, you know, where we place these types of things, it depends on the water levels. We do an analysis, we understand the water levels, where they sit relative to your structures, well, where if your house, make sure your house is set back far enough, that we do predictions of potential changes into the future to really understand how dynamic the beach is going to be, where changes are going to occur, and whether or not um, this is possible for your property. This is some examples of before and after. Um, you know, the reason I think most people live on the shoreline is because they love the beach and most people love to walk on the beach. And so, you know, having a natural shoreline, which is shown to the right, um, can provide more opportunities for that. So this is probably an example again, where um, there, it was just 
it was sort of a sign of the times. It was just something we did. We felt like we needed to de demarcate between the water and the upland. And there was, you can see there's grass and there was some wood that's there that probably got thrown up there. But with the restored shoreline down on the right, you have this these large pieces of wood which create great habitat. You have a beautiful transition in vegetation between the upland um, and the beach itself. And then you see all that, there's all this wood accumulating even within all of that grass. And so that really, all that vegetation and those roots and that wood is really what stabilizes the beach and the shoreline. I've mentioned wood a lot. Wood is an incredibly important for habitat but it's also just incredibly important for stabilizing the beaches. Um, our, our waterways actually have less wood than they would have historically um, because, well, there's a few reasons. It's collected so that vessels don't run into it and it's not a navigation hazard, um, but it's also um, just because we don't have as many trees along our shoreline to fall in onto the beaches um, and to naturally accumulate. So a lot of areas, they may actually need more wood and we can bring wood from other places. We're not cutting down trees necessarily to bring it, but it's, it's available from a variety of sources. Some of that wood that gets picked up in Puget Sound is available to be placed out on the beaches. Um, so wood is really important for a lot of different functions along the shoreline. Um, it also helps protect the, the base of bluffs and the base of banks. Doesn't accumulate necessarily in as large of widths just because of, of that type of shore form, but it's still really important. And I guess I just say about that too, that if trees fall from your bluff and onto your beach, we encourage you to leave them. Um, you know, they, they will adjust and, and change on their own and, and it's great to just leave them there and not cut them up, leave them intact. Um, this is a example of beach nourishment. So on the right, you can see it's super coarse, um, really just large cobbles, large rocks. So this armor rock was removed and, um, they brought in a volume of mixed grain sizes. And it's, there's specific sizes that we use. We match it to what your beach would be naturally, um, but we also match it to what the, um, the forage fish want, for example, what kind of grain size distribution is right for them. We also match it to the energetics. So um, how much wind wave energy might you observe on your beach? and um, what grain size is appropriate for that location. Um, this is Penrose Park. So another, this is a, a what we call a full um, restoration of both process and shoreline. So the upper image has a timber wall, a timber bulkhead. Um, and you can see that there was some grass um, on the upland of that, but this is a very old structure and over time um, basically water levels had already been overtopping the structure so you were actually getting erosion behind the structure um, which we see quite frequently. The other thing to notice in this before picture, Tracy if you could point your cursor at the end of that bulkhead um, away from the point you'll see that there's the shoreline is cut back yeah so that's an indication that you know this shoreline's been changing over time but the timber wall here has been holding this in place. And so it hasn't been able to adjust um, to the natural processes. The lower image is the after and um, some wood was brought in, some sediment was also brought in. So things that we look at for, for these kinds of restoration projects is, is there a healthy sediment supply to this, these beaches already? So this, that literal drift, or is all of the sediment in that literal drift cell, is it blocked? And so um, if it's blocked and we don't, it's in the beach basically has been um, devoid of sediment or is lacking of sediment, then we bring sediment in to restructure that and, and allow the change, the natural changes and forces to happen. A lot of this wood, some of this wood was placed, but a lot of this wood just accumulated naturally after that bulkhead was um, removed. So that's just another thing to note is that there's very little wood in front of that bulkhead before, but quite a lot of wood afterwards. And then look at all the shade. So that's the other great thing about this project. Look at all the shade on that shoreline. And that shade is really important um, for the various species and, and habitat. And that's because of the connection that's being made between the beach and the upland um, trees in this project. All right. 
Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> um, she's going to hand it off to me now to talk a little bit about shoreline vegetation. And to kick that off, I'm going to launch um, one more poll to get you guys um, interacting. I am curious, um, what kind of vegetation do you have on your property? And this is a multiple choice because obviously you might not have only one thing. Okay, it looks like the majority of people have voted. So I'll go ahead and end the polling. Wow, okay. Um, I mean, obviously some people have, have been able to pick multiple, but definitely the highest ranking one was um, native vegetation, which is interesting. Um, okay, and lots of trees as well. Okay, awesome. I'm going to talk a little bit about native vegetation. Um, this is probably one of the service areas that the shore friendly program um, can do a lot for homeowners um, because um, planting plans are something that could be um, um, done. And we can also assist with um, invasive, you know, helping you figure out a way to get rid of invasive vegetation, which as anybody who has some ivy or blackberry on their property knows is very hard to get rid of. Okay, um, so uh, marine riparian vegetation um, looks different depending on where you are in Puget Sound. It varies um, a lot depending on what type of slope you live on and how actively that slope is eroding. If you're on um, in a bluff, medium bluff or high bluff area that's very actively eroding, you may not have um, the chance, vegetation may not have a chance to establish. Um, it also obviously very, uh, depends on how much sunlight is getting to your property and how much rainfall you get. Although people tend to think that Washington um, you, you know, gets rain nine months out of the year, obviously people in Forks are getting a lot more rain than people in Squim. Um, and I got snow last night at my house in Snohomish, which I was, I was not expecting because I, I live in the convergence zone that Jessica talked about earlier. It also depends on how much wave action you're getting and um, salt spray that you might get up on your property. Um, obviously, some plants are more salt tolerant than others. Um, developed properties can have ornamentals or a mix of ornamentals and native vegetation, such as the example on the right, which has a kind of a buffer of some native species probably in there, but then backed with the, the grass closer to the parcels and the, the um, picture on the left is a pretty good example of invasive species, um, which are blackberry and ivy in that case that are, are pretty dominant on that shoreline right there. Um, so I'll go through a little bit about how vegetation um, stabilizes the soil. So first off, as rain's falling down, the leaves disperse the rainfall over an area. So you can think about if you have a downspout on your property, and all that rain is funneled into one area, if you don't have something to disperse that downspout at the bottom and it's just draining right onto open surface soil, you're gonna get a little river that occurs and that little river is gonna wash soil away. Um, roots uptake water and release that water to the ap atmosphere through a process called evapotranspiration. Roots are proportional to the size of the plant makes a lot of sense. A tree is going to have larger roots than um, you know, ground cover or grass would have. Grasses and ground covers, such as strawberry ferns or kinikinik, trap soil that is eroding on the surface and, and adhere that top, very top layer of surface soil um, to prevent surface soil erosion. Shrubs can stabilize the top couple layers of soil. 
And then tree roots can really tie multiple soil layers together because the, most of them tend to have one very large tap root that can go down quite far, sometimes as far as the height of the tree itself. And then it has tertiary root systems that branch out from there. Also, one thing that we've been mentioning multiple times is that vegetation provides shade and habitat in the near shore, which is really important to just all the species that live in the area. I also wanted to point out and reiterate what we've touched on a little bit is that vegetation and the vegetation buffer can improve water quality and studies definitely show that groundwater passing through a vegetative buffer um, improves in quality um, as it goes from one side of the buffer to the other. Um, we would definitely encourage you if you have vegetation on your property to keep and maintain that vegetation. Um, if you have invasives or you otherwise want to change the vegetation on your property, consider the role that I just talked about the vegetation is playing in stabilizing the soil and slopes on your property um, before removing it, even if it is invasive. Um, you can, and this is something you could reach out to, to Lisa for sure friendly advice, you know, to get a specific site visit on your property, but um, you can definitely um, try establishing new plants um, while maintaining the plants that you currently have. Again, even if they are invasives, because you don't want to just rip everything out and then have that soil exposed on your property. Um, one other thing I'd like to point out is that um, tree topping, which sometimes occurs to improve views, is really hard on trees. Um, so trees have a cambium layer that's underneath their bark. And you can think of that as like the cardiovascular system of the tree. And when you, you expose that cambium layer, it makes the tree very susceptible to disease. And there's a lot of other pruning methods that can be done to remove the lower limbs, um, such as moving little sections of lower limbs, um, like say three on one side of the tree, and that's called like windowing. And in many cases, um, certain trees like Douglas fir, um, they actually self prune as they get really big, the lower limbs tend to die and fall off. So we touched on, um, you know, mentioned native vegetation. That's definitely one of the, um, the focal points for any vegetation work that's done through shore friendly. Um, we wouldn't, um, through shore friendly, you wouldn't be getting a planting plan that had um, lawn with ornamentals around it, it would definitely incorporate um, native vegetation. This is just an example of some native vegetation that you would typically find on the shoreline in Puget Sound. Um, shore pine is pretty common and it's the uh, pine tree that if you go to the, the open Washington coast, um, you'll see it gets really twisted and gnarly um, because of the high winds and salt and all that that's going on and tends to get really big burls on it. And that's um, kind of where it gets its scientific name of Pinus contorta because it can be very contorted. In the Puget Sound area, it tends to grow up fairly tall and straight. Some shrubs that you might find around are thimbleberry, rose, um, hooker's willow is pretty common. There's a few other willows you could find in the near shore um, ocean spray. Um, and then in the, the smaller uh, grass sort of layer, um, ground cover layer, um, you might find strawberry, um, dune grass, or um, wormwood is another one that you could find. Um, here's an example. Jessica showed these pictures earlier, but I just wanted to kind of bring it around to a, from a vegetation standpoint and also a little bit in terms of you know what this structure is not doing is in it's not protecting from from high water levels really at all because in this case you can clearly see that there's a place where the water could go up it could get up behind that bulkhead and then it's going to have a much harder time draining out whereas on the right hand side the water level is going to be go, able to go up onto this property but because of the vegetation, it's going to be able to filter its way through and the vegetation is going to be able to help absorb some of that water as well.
And on the right, one thing I, I really like to hammer home because of you know my ecological background is that the picture on the right, that near shore, the, the water side is much more connected to that upland side. And there's a ability for nutrients and animals and everything to exchange just a lot more freely in that right hand after picture. Um, Okay, we're going to hand it back to to Jessica to just touch on a couple more things here. Um, great. So yeah, we just have a couple more slides. Um, so we've talked a bit about drainage already. Um, the importance of drainage management, drainage management plans. This is some. This is another area that the shore friendly program can definitely help with. Um, you know, Tracy described the process of vegetation. And so that runoff that's coming from the homes, one of the most important things is to find a way to get that water um, down into the groundwater table and not um, allow it to just drain up directly onto the surface, particularly if you're adjacent to a steep slope or even a medium bank um, property where it could run off the face and then actually cause unnecessary erosion. And there are, you know, there are things like rain gardens that can be done, but there are also, you can put it down into a trench with gravel. Um, I would, this requires some engineering design, um, probably some permitting if you're within 200 feet of the shoreline, which most of your properties are. Um, you know, there's some other things that are, you know, green roof solutions, for example, if you um, take it a whole kind of another level and step. And of course, obviously, vegetation. So we've talked a lot about the vegetation that can just help with the overall drainage of, of a site itself. Um, so we're just trying to basically uh, reduce the concentrated flows. Um, and if we can't, if it's not um, advisable. So we would typically have a geotechnical engineer do a visit for, for drainage management plans, particularly on a steep slope that's prone to slope failures. And if it's not possible to put the groundwater, um, put the stormwater down into the groundwater table through various mechanisms, then they do run pipes across the basin all the way down to the bottom of the slope. So it's not running across the slope. But those types of systems have a lot of maintenance um, challenges. And so we, we try to get it, um, do something more on the upland. And if you can actually direct water away from the slope, that's even better. So Lisa mentioned manage retreat. Um, so we did do a, we did a cost benefit analysis for Island County Shore Friendly Program um, about a year ago or so. And we looked at the value of land relative to the different shoreline treatment options, um, which included whether they had hard armor, if they removed hard armor, if they um, put in soft shorelines, um, if there was um, actually a house setback. And so um, there was a, a couple of examples where homes were actually picked up and set back and it actually showed an increase in the overall land value of that particular property relative to adjacent properties. However, what some of the things in terms of thinking about managed retreat is that this particular home that we're showing um, up on top of the bluff, it's probably too late to set back that home. Um, so you need to be able to actually get the equipment to the home and physically be able to lift it, lift it up to move it back. Um, so don't wait <laughs> too long if you're in this kind of situation um, and before you start thinking about um, moving a home back. Some homes can be, you know, raised as well. That's, that's an option, not on the steep bluff, for, but for some other treatments. But <clears throat> it's something that if you're on a high bluff, you should be, and you don't have a very large setback to the top of the slope and you have any room, to move your home back, it's something you might wanna seriously consider. Um, so I mentioned that cost benefit analysis. Um, the Shore Friendly, Island County Shore Friendly website actually has um, some, 
succinct. You don't have to read the whole report. There's a couple of, there's a four pager and then two, two page handouts. There's one that's really specific to high bank homes and one that's really specific to low bank homes. And then the four pager covers everything, including the medium banks, which is the, the somewhere in between um, type of practice. Um, the, one of the other interesting things that came out of that was that armoring was one of the most expensive shoreline treatments. So we had actual costs for doing a variety of these projects and um, over the course of 40 different projects, um, installing hard armor was the most expensive. So if you don't have armor now, we encourage you to, to think about not putting it in. Um, and if you feel like you're at risk and you, you have erosion that you need mitigation for, you need assistance with, again, reach out to Shore Friendly for a site visit. Um, and we'd like to take a look and see if there, you have options um, in terms of if there needs to be protection or maybe, maybe it's not as bad as we think, who knows? Um, that, that's the best case scenario. All right, awesome. Thanks, Jessica. So um, I'm actually, I'm gonna do one last poll before people start to, to duck out before answering to just um, see what people thought of the presentation. Give us a little feedback. I do believe Lisa will be sending out a more, um, another um, survey monkey as well a, that goes along with our follow-up email to anybody that was on the call. Um, so if people could answer, um, if you felt like this webinar was a good use of your time, um, did you learn something new today? And also probably the most important for people um, is uh, what other topics would you be interested in learning? I know Lisa, Lisa is considering and planning um, some additional workshops like this. You know, hopefully at some point this year, we will be able to do this um, in person. But if not, you know, it would be in a similar format to this. And that question um, on other topics is multiple choice. So I'll give, I'll give a good chunk of time for the majority of people to answer that because we would really like to know what you'd be interested in learning about in the future. So I did see somebody ask about what is soft armoring. So I'm just gonna hit on that while you're waiting on that. So soft armoring or soft shorelines, it basically means that we're recreating a beach as nearly as closely as we possibly can. Um, it, and sometimes it may not be exactly what would be there naturally. It might have to be a little bit higher or the material might be have to be a little bit bigger so that it doesn't move. Um, or there might be more wood, but it's 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 as close to natural as as we we can be, but it still provides some stabilization to the shoreline. So it's not totally natural in that it doesn't have complete freedom to move around and fluctuate as maybe as much as a natural shoreline would. Otherwise, it would basically just be what we would call shoreline restoration, restoring natural process. Okay, thanks, Jessica. It looks like. Um... It looks like people are done. So, um, wow, everybody thought it was a good use of their time. That's great. <laughs> that makes me feel good. Um, um, looks like most people said that they they learned um, learned something new. And then Lisa's got, oh, I like it. So the number one ranked in things they want to learn more about is using plants to stabilize shorelines. <laughs> um, so great. So thank you. Um, thank you for joining. And I'm going to hand it off to Lisa um, to, to do, ask, give us any more questions with the remaining time and also to just do any wrap up that she would like to share. All right. Well, that was a lot of information and a lot of great questions were coming up on this last uh, segment. Um, one in particular that um, was brought up that I will do my best to provide a graphic for you um, when I respond um, with our follow-up information. There's a couple questions about um, what happens, you know, what do we see when beaches are restored? Like when we remove shoreline armor, uh, what are the, um, you know, the beaches are gonna restore at different rates and what do we see first? And typically um, what we see first when we remove armor is that we see a, a, a pretty quick return of the stuff that's referred to as beach rack. So all that eelgrass and you know, other materials that wash up with every tide cycle, um, that is one of the first things that washes up um, and stays around. 
And that provides a lot of nutrients. There are a lot of, um, a lot of organisms that live only in that beach rack. They don't live in the upland and they don't live in the marine waters. And they're really critical for marine birds, for shorebirds and for fish. Um, so that's a really important thing that we see. Uh, and then we tend to see some of the wood, the larger wood starts returning. Um, and with that wood, once the wood starts to build up and it recruits more wood, then we get beach sediment building up around that. And then from there, then we'll get some vegetation that can start building up within that wood if it's high enough on the beach. Um, so there's a whole, kind of a whole, um, you know, um, kind of a, a line of, of improvement that we see over time, but it takes a long time. And the thing that takes the longest to recover on our marine shorelines is the vegetation. So, you know, we try and incorporate um, good amounts of riparian vegetation, like Tracy was talking about with trees and shrubs and undercover, ground cut, excuse me, ground covers and dune grass. And once that gets established too, then that provides nutrients back into the marine shorelines too, that is really critical for all of our marine species. So um, again, there, we have a graphic provided from, from Jason Toft, who's a, um, a biologist with a, uh, at U University of Washington, and he's done a lot of studies on this stuff, and I can provide that graphic to you. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about plants, which I think Tracy probably covered a lot of it. We can provide you with long with lists and lists of plants. Um, it's definitely important to know that you know you put the right plant in the right place, like you would on your normal gardening uh, aspects. But if you live you know, up in the up outside of the shoreline, it's also pretty important if you live on a bluff to be careful about where you plant and how you plant. Uh, so we'll provide a lot of those details to you as well. Um, I do want to continue to encourage everybody to sign up for those site visits. Um, you know, they're, they're free. Uh, we also would um, encourage you to, in, to invite your neighbors. Uh, we'd like to do them, you know, with more than just one person, because as you learned tonight, the shoreline is a really dynamic place. And looking at it just from one parcel at a time, it doesn't give us a big, a full enough picture to really make an assessment and to help you make the best decisions. So um, you know, we've had a lot of information flowing tonight and I don't wanna to continue to overload everybody's brains, but um, we'll be sending out this huge list of online resources um, for you so you can do a lot of your own research, but also don't hesitate to contact me um, you know, by email um, you know, and we can, we can continue our discussions. Uh, and like uh, Tracy mentioned um, and Jessica too, you know, we wanna to continue to do these kinds of workshops. Um, we definitely wanna do some vegetation workshop, drainage information, uh, and we encourage you to keep in touch with us too. And I think that's probably about it for me. Um, you know, our, our, our website provides a lot of information on, um, on other services we can provide for you that I mentioned quickly in the beginning, um, cost share opp opportunities, um, design permitting assistance for uh, armor removal, vegetation design, drainage design. And again, we can talk individually about those um, in, in the future too. But again, I thank you all for joining us tonight and we hope you continue to, to follow us. Hey, Lisa, so somebody just asked what they'd get out of a site visit. Do you want to address that real quick before we go? Yeah, I can definitely address that. So a site visit, um, depending on the type of site assessment that, um, that you might need, is typically to start with somebody like, like Jessica, you know, a coastal engineer or a coastal geologist coming and taking a look at everything from your erosion rates on your shoreline, you know, what's, what's the drift um, looking like in your area? Uh, do you have a bulkhead, do you not? And what are the impacts um, of, of that bulkhead if it's there? They'll look at vegetation, you know, it's kind of a course overview um, of the drainage, the vegetation, the erosion, um, you know, where your house is set on your property, uh, taking a quick look, you know, kind of either side of what's going on. And you'll get a, like a four page report um, kind of outlining all of the findings um, and then also providing a nice list of recommendations, kind of that, you know, just basic, you know, touch, you know, touching base on those um, really initial things that we think you could do to improve your, um, your property for your own benefit to protect your house, but also to benefit um, the ecosystem around you. And then if you, if you need additional services, say we recommend that you, you, know, you, you wanna do an entire planting plan. We can also do another site visit that's specific to vegetation or specific to drainage. Uh, and then once we go from there, then we kind of get into more of like a cost share uh, where maybe you'll help um, fund a little bit of the design and we'll put in some grant funding to support some of that all the way through implementation um, over the next couple of years if needed. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, I think that was great. Yeah. Um, there's been some questions, you know, about practices that people are observing. And, you know, I, I think that this is where we encourage people to reach out for site visits and folks like Lisa, 
and the other, um, the MRCs, you know, can help reach out to neighbors, try to educate. A lot of it's just about education and really helping people to understand um, what should and shouldn't be done. Yep. Yeah, one of the best ways to do this too, um, not just even you and your neighbors, if you live in like a community association, you know, we can come out and do, especially once, you know, we're all and more comfortable having you know bigger groups outside on the beach. We can do a huge, a large site visit and a beach walk just with you and your neighbors and you and your, your community association. And we can sit down and we can you know, we can talk about a lot of the subjects that we've covered tonight for those that weren't here. So we have a lot of different ways that we can um, we can continue to provide information and education to you and your neighbors. And then someone's asking if they need to be home for a site visit. Nope, not necessarily. It's always better if you are home so that we can ask you specific questions, you know, things that you see, because, you know, your observations are one of the best ways that, um, that we can get an idea of what's really going on. But when you sign up for a site visit, you give us a whole lot of information. And we can also kind of do a pre-assessment and do a little bit of a virtual visit too, uh, and kind of walk through a bunch of photos and get an idea of what your concerns are. Um, but you know, if you can be there, that's, that's one of the best things, but we, if you're willing to let us go on your property without you being there, we can do that too. And what time of year do we do site visits? We do them year round, as long as the tides aren't too high for us to get down on the beach. And it's not, you know, you know, we don't, we don't really mind the pouring rain so much, you know, we just believe in, in good rain year. <laughs> Lisa, are you going to post the recording on the Northwest Straits Foundation website? Somebody said they had the wrong email. So just make sure people can oh. access all this stuff. Yeah, we'll post a link there, uh, and you can always contact me and provide me with your um, with your uh, your right email address too. But yeah, we'll post it there, and I would imagine it'll probably end up like on I don't know how the the Zoom recordings get uh, formatted, but we could also probably add it to our YouTube channel. Maybe I'm not sure how that works. Yeah, we'll we'll figure that one out. But I think we would be able to post it on your YouTube channel. And if you're you're having trouble, you know, writing down, you get Lisa's email from this uh, from the you you've got right now wrong or something you could also reach out to me any zoom confirmation you got would have my email and i can make sure you get in contact with the right um person like lisa um to for further questions somebody real quick just asked if we're associated with friends of the san juans um we're a partner of them um, we work you know hand in hand if if you have if you live in the san juans and you want a site visit out there um the friends of the san juans is kind of helping to organize those out there Well, you'll do it through, you know, we can originally get, you can do it through us or we can do it through them. And Island County, so maybe just a little plug too, we're going to be doing another workshop in Island County. Um, March, when is that, Tracy? I believe it's 17th. March 17th. March and 17th. That yeah, and it's a little bit earlier. It's from 4 to 6 p.m. And um, we will have a little bit more focus on the different um, bluff heights. So we'll have a breakout session for either a low bank, no bank, a medium bank or a high bank and just kind of give a little bit more specifics to those. And that one I said was from four to six and where are you registered um, for this, uh, this meeting? You could also register for the, the Island County one, but I will say a lot of the content will be the same, but if you happen to have friends, neighbors that live on the shoreline that weren't able to join this, even if they're not in Island County, that next one would definitely be applicable for them. Um, somebody asked about information if you live on freshwater uh, or in lakes. Uh, you definitely may have pick, uh, picked up that we are a marine oriented organization. Um, we pretty much, if it's salty, you know, we'll work on it. We don't do a lot in the freshwater other than maybe immediately like in an estuary, um, you know, or a creek that's running directly into the sound. But there's an organization or a program called um, Green Shores for Homes that you can look up and they have a lot of similar type of work um, and information um, about erosion and erosion management um, for living on lakes. Okay. Let's see, anything else we can touch on quickly? There's a question about planning for a, um, a high bank with 75 feet of wetland below the bank up to the beach. Um, well, I'd say those wetlands are probably a good protection for you. And they can provide a good buffer, without a doubt. <laughs> Sounds like it could be a barrier embayment or a pocket estuary. Mm -hmm. And if whether if it doesn't have a lot of water in it now, 
whether or not it was filled or if it's, um, you know, naturally freshwater marsh, but could be opportunities for restoring that estuary too, if it's um, if it's freshwater and was historically salt marsh, which is something that North Coast Straits Foundation and and other marine resource communities are certainly interested in. So, but yeah, it, um, not you know those things. Water quality is an issue, so we're still interested in sort of the drainage management in terms of not tightlining um, stormwater directly down into that estuary. We'd be concerned about the water quality aspects of that. And so trying to get that, um, stormwater with some kind of LID treatment or down into the groundwater table to be filtered before discharging, um, and not disposing of yard waste. I saw some things of asking about yard waste. Yard waste is not native vegetation, is not, um, does not help with <laughs> stabilizing beaches. It's not the same thing, particularly if it's invasive species. We really don't want that, you know, being deposited on the, the beaches and shorelines. So. Somebody asked about damaged and abandoned tight lines um, and providing tight line cleanup services. That's definitely something we've been trying to find is, you know, a whole group of contractors that really do um, good tight line work. Uh, and we don't necessarily have that yet, but we're continuing to look for it. But um, definitely ma managing your tight lines, you know, if you have them and making sure that they're not cracked or broken is really important. So this is the islands with no ferry service. Uh, yes, possibly. Um, one of our other consultants uh, has a boat. <laughs> and so sometimes, you know, he will go out um, on his boat and get to get there. That's probably more, you know, we probably do that more in the spring and summer and early fall. So if you can wait, <laughs> send people out in a boat in the middle of winter. <laughs> All right. Well, it is eight o'clock now. So I think we're going to wrap it up for now and say thank you to everybody for joining. This was great. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks everybody for coming. And, you know, as Lisa said, we will send a, a follow-up email to people. This presentation will be available. There's an, another presentation very similar in a couple of weeks, if you know somebody who wasn't able to attend. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to learn about the um, Northwest um, Puget Sound shorelines. And if you don't necessarily have to be a resident of Island County to sign up for that one too. Would, yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody have a good night. Thank you.